welcome to the 1000 Hours Outside podcast. My name is Ginny Urich, the founder of the 1000 Hours Outside movement. We are kicking off season three today with the red cape to teacher, Teacher Tom. Welcome, Teacher Tom. Look, I got a picture of the red cape oh, right there. You got me in my red cape. Hi, Jenny. It's nice to be here. I have been a, a huge fan of yours for a very, very long time. I love your books. Um, and I love your blog. You're so consistent with writing and have been for so many years. I know you've impacted so many families. So thank you for taking time to be here. Oh, no worries. This is a lot of fun. I'm glad I'm here. Yeah, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to be sitting across the screen from you. What a what a delight. Let me read your bio here real quick. Um, your actual name is Tom Hobson. Uh, everybody referred to as Teacher Tom, which is super cool. Uh, teacher Tom is an early childhood educator, international speaker, education consultant, teacher of teachers, parent educator, and author. He is best known, however, for his namesake blog, Teacher Tom's Blog, where he has posted daily for over a decade. What a commitment. Chronicling the life and times of his little preschool in the rain-soaked Pacific Northwest corner of the USA. Um, you talk about your sort of journey here in your bio about how um, your daughter was enrolled in the cooperative preschool and then she moved on, but you stayed behind. Um, you have play-based uh, pedagogy, uh, online courses, and an online early childhood conference. That's usually in the fall, right? Oh, that's um, going to be in, actually in summertime. June. In the summertime, okay. Um, you consult with organizations all around the globe. Um, and you have two fantastic books. Uh, Teacher Tom's first book. These, I just, <laughs> I'm so, I'm so tickled by these, really. You know, because you make a book and it's everything's about the title and the cover. But if you have good content, all you have to do is call it Teacher Tom's first book. It's fabulous. And Teacher Tom's second book. I mean, this is just the best. They're fantastic books. They really. And they made me really reminisce on my own kids when they were small. And and it's delightful to meet people who delight in children. So, um, and and real quick before we move on, you have um, a new course coming out mid-January. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I, I've, um, you know, I've been, I think like you mentioned, I started writing that blog back in 2009 and I've been, you know, I've been promoting play-based education, right? Self-directed learning for young children, you know, putting children back in charge of asking and answering their own questions, you know, giving them a childhood, really, kind of mm -hmm. super turbulent, actually. Um, and I've been doing it for a long time and talking about this and, you know, and, and I would get on a regular basis, I get people asking me, you know, like, oh man, I wish you would come and just, you know, hang out at my school for a while so I could learn to do what you do, or I'd like to have my school be more like yours and all that. And, um, you know, and, and the blog is part of how I try to help people with that. Um, but I realized that people are asking for more. So we're uh, this, you know, my wife and I, my wife's my business partner. So when I say we, that's, it's not like yep. some big corporation or anything. It's just the two of us. We're the same um, over here. We decided that what we would do was, um, uh, was have an e-course called uh, Teacher Tom's Introduction to Play-Based Learning. And really provide people, you know, this you know, nice, you know, six plus hours of content, uh, chance for them to really think about the things that I think about. I, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not a directive teacher. Um, and I'm not with young children. I wouldn't be that way with adults. But I hope to create a, I, you know, try to create an environment in which people can think about their own practice as early childhood educators and as parents. Yes. And how they can create a world in which their children are thriving and succeeding yeah. through their own self-directed activity. So that's what that course is going to be all about. And if anybody wants to, uh, we don't even have a web page for it yet, but we should have it done in the next couple of weeks here. Um, anybody who's interested can just email teacher Tom Hobson at teachertomsworld.com and just put, you know, e-course wait list in the subject line and we'll make sure you get all the information you need. Perfect. And then when you actually have the site up, I'll make sure to share that with people as well. Yeah, I love yeah. that. I love that it's for teachers and parents. I think one of the things you talk about in your book is that, you know, that even the after school time, you know, if we don't feel it quite so much and, um, you know, it's like everyone has some time, you know, we all have a different amounts and different amounts of margin and just very different life situations. But, you know, we all have some time that we get to pick and choose what we do with. And so uh, what a perfect opportunity for parents and for teachers. So um, I'm excited about that. I'll definitely, yeah, like I said, I'll share that. 
I'm excited that, you know, it's the same, the same story with the book, right? I didn't write that book. I wrote the book, I don't know what, not too many years ago, that first book. And I really honestly was never going to write a book. <laughs> People kept saying to me, when are you going to write a book? I'd say, I'm giving away my best writing online for free every day. Um, but finally, I was persuaded to do it. And I feel like this course is sort of like that too. People have yeah. been asking for it for a long time. So yeah. I'm excited. To, to That's do. awesome. Cool. That's awesome. And the books really are fantastic, Tom, because, you know, it's just, you know, I'm a writer, so I can take your book, you know, and I can flip through and, and make my notes and, and, you know, earmark the pages. So uh, these are fantastic books. Teacher Tom's first book and Teacher Tom's second book. Uh, okay, these books are filled with, I mean, I've got so many topics here to talk about, but, but the thing I'm most interested about, and I'm not finding it here much, is how did you end up here? Ah. How did you end up as the red tape, red cape teacher, Tom? You know, I, I read a little bit about how you went to a cooperative preschool. You were there as a parent and then you stayed. And I read a little bit about going to play Iceland and different things. But I think a lot of times it takes a really long time to get to these places where we're comfortable with um, kids being in charge of their own education. So what was that path like for you? Well, it's a it's an evolutionary process for everybody, mm -hmm. and it's true that you know I I say this a lot. I, I I like I said I've been writing the blog since 2009, and I can go back and I haven't deleted a single thing. I've left everything on there I've written, and I've been writing almost every single day. And there are many, especially in 2009, 2010, that I I'm humiliated, I'm embarrassed, I was wrong, I have evolved beyond, but that's okay. I, I've just, I've thought about deleting them or editing or changing them. I thought, no, I want people to see the journey yeah. um, because, you know, uh, we live in a world right now where we really, most people, not you, not me, not people listening to this, right? But most of the people in the world kind of consider children to be sort of these little idiots who, if we aren't on top of them, helping them every second of every day, they're just, you know, they're going to kill themselves or they're going to you know, maim themselves or they're going to, they're going to teach, they're going to become video zombies or video game zombies or something like that. And I think, so it takes us a long time to unlearn that. Yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is that, you know, the way we've set up modern society is that most of us, you know, after we are no longer a child, we don't spend time with children again until we're parents, right? I mean, there's this whole gap yeah. of time, often 20 years or more where we don't spend any time, children aren't in our lives, or if they are, they're like the annoying pest in the restaurant or they kick in the back yeah. of your seat in the airplane. And, you know, you don't really, um, you know, there's some of us who are better than that. But I think really one of the things that's happened over the course of the last century or so is that we adults have become separated from children. Mm. And if you look at the way society's set up, where, you know, we end up with, you know, we put all the kids over here in their preschools, you know, and even, you know, and they have them their own thing. And, you know, this is, you know, God love the unschoolers and the homeschoolers and the people who consider to have children at the center of their lives. But most of us, you know, are sending the kids off the preschools. The adults go to this place called work, which is completely separate. Never the two get to meet. And then we've even gone so far as we've got all the senior citizens living halfway across the country, the grandparents mm -hmm. from these grandkids. And they're over here in their senior centers or wherever they are, you know, can't wait, counting the days till they get to see their grandkids. Yeah. And what we've done is we've removed children from the center of society. And so what happened to me, <laughs> to get the long-winded way of answering your question, is uh, I was lucky. I was one of the most lucky men on earth is that when our daughter was born, my wife was, the, was a breadwinner. She, we, had plenty, we had enough money to live on with one income. So I took, I just, I just stopped my career. I was, a, I was a freelance writer. That's what I was doing. And just said, you know what? All I'm going to do is I'm going to be a stay-at-home parent and take care of the kid. And, and part of it was totally selfish. I love the idea of just cozying in with her all day long and, and then playing little games and reading stories and all that kind of stuff. And then she would, you know, and I'm basically an introvert, right? So that's the introvert's dream, right? To putter around the house all day with your baby and just kind of, you know, she, my, my, my our daughter is, is much more like my wife. She's much more of an extrovert. She gets her energy from being with other people. And mm -hmm. before she was even a year and a half, I mean, she was maybe a year old. She would say, she would say to me, today, let's go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> let's do something. And, you know, you know, we were playing outside and everything. We were doing all the good mm -hmm. stuff. So, you know, like, all right. Um, you know, so I, 
I started going to playground and stuff that wasn't quite right. And I thought, okay, well, maybe she needs preschool, right? You know, maybe that's what she's asking me for. I mean, it seemed too young, you know, she's not even want to, and she doesn't have to have it. We didn't need the childcare. Um, and then when I asked my wife, um, Jennifer, I asked, you know, I said, I think she needs preschool. She said, no way. <laughs> she's, she's got a stay at home parent. We don't need to go warehouse or somewhere, which is of course what a lot of us think about preschool. And then, uh, and then I went behind my wife's back and talked to my mom. <laughs> she said the same thing that I whipped behind both of their backs and talked to my mother-in-law. She said the same thing. So, you know, in a, in a person's life, those three important women say something, you have to do it. You don't mm -hmm. really. So it was like, okay, well, I'm, you know, stay at home parent. I don't know <laughs> what to do. So started trying to cobble together this social life, being at playgrounds, going to museums or whatever. And uh, at one point I met a woman uh, who was there at the playground with her son with our kids were playing and, she, and I told her my story. I told her probably exactly the same story I just told you. And she said, well, um, she said, you know, we're in a preschool where the parents go to school with the kids. It's called a cooperative school. And I thought that sounded like a pretty good idea. That sounded like a good deal. And that passed the mother, mother-in-law, wife test. And so I, uh, and so that's really how I got started is I started going to school and I suddenly realized I had children at the center of my life. I had not just my own, but I had this group of 20 or so children whose parents were also there who I got to know. And we had this community that was based on children. And I began to see, I found like, there were a lot of powerful things in me. I mean, there's all, I can talk about all the things I did with kids, but in me, what happened suddenly, I found myself more attentive. I found myself more present. I found myself um, more creative, hanging around with these creative geniuses all day long. And I also, I just suddenly, I, and the way I like to, the story, the way I like to say it is that I rediscovered the underside of tables, right? Because as a kid, you knew what the underside of every table in your house looked like. And yeah. did, you had stories about it. And suddenly I was down there with the children doing this. And I realized that, you know, this is where I want to be. This is where real life is happening. And so, you know, and, and by the time our daughter, so I went to school with her for three years as, as a cooperative parent. And then her teacher, one of my great mentors, a woman named Chris David, um, just said, hey, you know, you want to be a teacher? I think you should be a teacher. And I said, okay, that sounds good. What do I need to do? And so I did a little coursework, but even before I was done with it, Woodland Park had hired me. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. <laughs> wow. I'm really thrilled to learn that story. Really thrilled. I wondered. I wondered. And you were there for three years with your daughter. So that makes sense because you had that three years to really acclimate to that sort of child-directed lifestyle. Exactly. And, well, I got yeah. to learn from a master. She was a master early mm -hmm. childhood educator and she yeah. was a committed play-based educator. Yeah. And you know what, Tom, do you know, sometimes you think about like, what if that woman wouldn't have been at the park that day? Like, yeah. do you ever think about stuff like that? Sometimes Quite how the course of our life is changed by such small things sometimes, you know? I might be wearing a three-piece suit right now. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What a story. So, okay. So for families who don't know, uh, tell us about Woodland Park. Tell us about, tell us about the preschool cooperative. Okay. So a cooperative school is a school. It's a, it's a entity. It's a model in which the parents who enroll their children are the legal owners of the school. So, you know, we will, so, and they are, this is legal. This is registered with the secretary of state or a non not-for-profit corporation. Um, and, you know, the parents then, so they own and operate the school, they make all the decisions, about, they do all the, they do all the financial work, they do all the janitorial work, they do the, uh, they do the, you know, all, every, enrollment, they do everything that goes into making a school happen. Um, and the only thing, I'm the only paid employee. So the teacher is the only paid employee and the teacher's responsibility is the curriculum, the classroom, but everything else that goes into making a school operate is done by the parents. So this is a way, you know, to have a very inexpensive uh, preschool model. It's wow. one for parents who want to have a lot of say in their child's, in their child's early childhood experience and don't want to be separated from them. I mean, that's yeah. the beauty part of it is we're enrolling families, not children. Yeah. Uh, and as a teacher and as a, both as a parent and a teacher, for me, the most important part was that as an obligation of ownership, you put in uh, at least one day a week in the classroom as the assistant, as an assistant teacher. Mm -hmm. And so this means that you know, as an educator, I'm in there and I might be there, I might have 20 kids, but I'll sometimes, if it's the younger kids, sometimes I'll have 11 adults in the room, wow. right? So we get a two to one ratio kind of thing. And so we have this, and it's a real sense of community because grandparents show up and aunts and uncles show up and older siblings come. And so what we're doing is, is it, you know, people who come to visit our school have always been sort of, 
they said, gosh, it looks just like from the blog. It, it sounds like from the blog, except there's a lot of grownups around here. I wasn't expecting that. And part of my job is to teach the grownups, to ha- edu- educate them. Uh, and, and I do that through role modeling. We do that through monthly parent education. So the parents are required. That's again, part of their ownership obligation is to show up for parent education meetings once a month. And we contract with uh, North Seattle College for parent educators. So they're not always just hearing from me. Mm-hmm. And so some of my, my again, some of my greatest mentors have been those parent educators who uh, have been teaching me every month for the last 20 years. Wow. Um, and, so th- and so it's a great experience for these parents. And so they come in and so we educate them on, on what play-based education is all about, what child-directed learning is all about. We help them deal with things like, you know, conflict resolution and, you know, and uh, children who are hitting and kicking and, you know, those kind of things. It's all the kind of problematic things. Uh, we get to do it in a com- community. And oh, what I love really about this is that suddenly, like a parent who's struggling with their child hitting, for example, they can step back and watch another parent work on it. Hmm. And they suddenly get this idea because then the mo- there's not that wow. emotion. There. So suddenly you're saying, wait a minute, I'm just like that. Wow. But she's not all upset about it. She's, you know, mm-hmm. and or, you know, they see me do it or somebody else in the classroom. So it's, it's like a parenting cooperative in a way. Um, we yeah. call it a preschool. Um, but really yeah. it's, it's a chance to get together in, this, in a community. And to me, yeah. that's the only thing that we need in life, especially wow. in the years as community. Yeah, you talk about that a lot in your book, but this is an interesting component of it. Like you talk about how, well, really like with nature, you know, it benefits any age, right? You talk about if the grandma's 100 and the baby's one month, you know, this community, it benefits every age. And we're so separated from each other that it would be hard to know what to do with your child, you know, in this sort of situation. But then if you're there and you get to see it, uh, Wow. And I, and I loved in your book and you talk about families, you enroll families, you would say like such and such child has been here since in utero, you know, like this child's been coming, you know? Uh, So um, what a lasting impact on these families. Because most kids would stay for at least three years, some of them for four years. And and then siblings sometimes. Yeah. If I knew them, yeah. If I knew them in, in, in utero, um, that meant, that meant, you know, I'd already known them for the first five years of their lives yeah. um, before they set out into the world. So I was a part of the family. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so let's talk about, let's talk about play. Okay. I think that's it. That's an easy one to start with. Um, you, you talk a lot about policymakers. Um, and I used to be actually an, um, a for, I was a former public school teacher. I taught math. So I'm aware of the policymakers that these decisions seem to come from the heavens. Uh-huh. You don't know where they come from. Um, I think that parents probably think that they come from teachers, but they don't. Um, so you talk in your book a lot about policymakers, um, that they're deciding, you know, what we should learn and when we should learn it. And out of the infinite amount of things, this is what you should do and do it now, you know, but you have a totally different approach that kids through their own play, figure out what they're going to learn. So that's, that's a broad based uh, topic to jump off of. But for parents who are leery, um, let's talk about how kids learn through play. Oh, well, the first thing I would do is say the other thing that I think most of us and I was right with all parents in this when my child was starting school is I assumed that school and curriculum was based on research and data and best practices. That is emphatically not true. Um, The research, the the overwhelming amount of research done on the way children learn points to play-based education. Yes. Um, This increasing emphasis that we have and, you know, the policymakers that I talk about, you know, first of all, Whenever they talk about education, they always talk about it as, as job training, even in preschool. They're always talking about getting the kids ready for those jobs of tomorrow. We got to out educate the Chinese, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, and this can be anybody from Bernie Sanders to Donald Trump. They're all wrong about it, right? Every mm-hmm. one of these politicians, when they talk about it, and very often administrators, they'll talk about, you know, well, we got to get them career and college ready. And that, of course, is not the purpose of education in a democratic society. The purpose of an education is to, is to create critical thinkers, think, t- people who can take part in the project of self-governance. And it's the reason education is so important in our society, is so that our, our children, you know, and if you think about it, <laughs> the, 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 the skills required to do well in a job are very often the exact opposite 
of the skills required to do well uh, as a citizen. And you know, the first one that comes to mind, and this is one that's, I'm, I'm answering your question. Um, the first one is- Oh, well, with a is, broad question. <laughs> the one that comes to me is obedience, right? Because if you are insubordinate in your corporate job, you're out of there, right? If you just don't do what the CEO says to do, they don't have any need for you. They get you out of there. So if you, if you do that, but in a democracy, in a self-governing society, we need people who challenge authority, who question authority, who say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like what I already know about the world. Tell me more, give me more information and challenging and questioning these things and thinking for themselves and asking a lot of questions and standing up for their beliefs. Another thing you don't really get to do in your corporate job or your, you know, your a normal job. So the skills are completely different. And so often what our schools are doing, so that, so to me, that's not based on research. That's based on the economy. That's based on economic yeah, and, and convenience. It's I convenient. think right. like, so when I took my educator courses, we learned about best practices, but the best yeah. practices were about how to shuttle 30 kids through your curriculum. Yep. And that's it. You know, yeah, how do you class, manage class, a classroom of 30 classroom people who don't want to do? Yeah. Classroom management and getting them yeah. to do what they don't want to do. And yeah. so, and you know, and so when, and then the research though, and I mentioned the research and I, you know, there's two different kinds of research, first of all. Carol Black is the one who I found out about this from, and she, in her, uh, what was it? she wrote this incredible essays. I, I'll have to give you the title later. Mm -hmm. um, but in this, she talks about, she goes, you know, like most of the research that policymakers use to, to, to create schools, to create curriculum and everything else, they use research that is done on children in school. Mm -hmm. And she says that is the equivalent of going to SeaWorld to study orca whales. Wow. <laughs> yes. Because if you really want to understand orca whales, right, you study them in the wild. So the research done on children at play, which is the natural habitat of children and specifically outdoors at play. Mm -hmm. um, when we do the research there, we find that, you know, for certain, that this academic type training is actually damaging their future, um, their future ability, like reading, for example. Um, the research done on reading overwhelmingly um, shows that children who receive early uh, literacy instruction, so before the age of five, get a tiny head start on the other kids. By the time they're eight years old, that has vanished. By the time they're 15, the children who receive the instruction read less for pleasure and with lower comprehension than the children who are allowed to wait till at least seven, eight, nine years old. And the truth is, is what most unschoolers and homeschoolers who have the courage to do this are, have discovered is that most, most children, reading is like walking. Reading is like talking. It is something that will, they will learn, and, and it's really hard, right? Right now, I can already imagine some of your listeners or viewers sitting there going, oh, I don't have the courage for that, oh, come on. We, of course, it doesn't make sense they know how to read or something like that. But I guarantee that if we started children, teaching children how to walk in school, it would take less than a generation before we would all believe the only way kids learn how to walk is in school. Yeah, because uh, walking, that's a really complicated thing. It's a complex, mm -hmm. the human brain can do incredibly complex things. And literacy is one of the foundational things of the modern human brain. Um, so, and we're motivated to that. And when we watch children learn to do that, and what, this is the other interesting thing about that. I'll, I won't stick to literacy, but. No, I wanna, I wanna camp out on literacy. I put a lot of notes here. I think it's one good. One of the most interesting things about this is that usually when children are, so the natural window for learning to read seems to be between about seven and 11 years old, mm -hmm. right? And you know, even you and I are gonna freak out if a kid's not reading by the time they're nine or 10 probably. But the truth is, is that people who have the courage to let the child's reading um, emerge naturally, and, and we're not talking about kids with dyslexia and other right. kinds of learning differences. Um, we're talking about you know, neurotypical children um, who allow them, the kids can go from not reading at all to reading Harry Potter in about two weeks. <laughs> Yes. This was our experience, Tom. We did it. And I was freaked out. I was freaked out. But all the research said to wait. And so for our oldest, we're a homeschooling family. Um, and so for our oldest, we waited until he was seven. And and I maybe would have even waited longer, but I didn't want him to be embarrassed out in certain situations. And so we did this. Um, it's pretty boring, but it's teach your child to read in a hundred lessons or something. You know, it just takes 10 minutes a day. And so yeah. We hit less than maybe 70. So we've spent, you know, 700 minutes, hours, hardly any time. And we went from like, you know, the fat cat, 
rides the bird, you know, and then all of a sudden the next day he's like, and in Thanksgiving, November, he's reading everything. It was, and I didn't do it. No. And so with our subsequent kids, if you have that one time under your belt, then with the subsequent kids, I I don't even know how some of them learned how to read, but they did, you know? So I think it's so important for parents to hear that seven to 11. I, um, uh, next week, I think, is a podcast with Carla Hannaford. Do you mm-hmm. know her? Smart Moves? I think she is. I don't know her. but She's a, a PhD, right? Smart Moves. She's written all these books, and she didn't read until she was 11. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's, there are a lot of the smartest people in my life. I did mm-hmm. not, well, some of them didn't even talk until they were like four years old. I mean, wow. this is the kind of thing right now we'd have so many interventions. So anyway, so what we learned about children is that is that most educational institutions, right? You talked about the curriculum you have to deliver and all this. It's all about adults deciding what questions to ask the kids, what areas they need to explore and understand, and then marching them through it, right? One way or another. Yeah, some of you, I'm sure you were a genius teacher, right? You could drool or trick them or- <laughs> Yeah, right. yeah somehow, sure. But how dishonest is that, right? Because you're, you're constantly, you're not just- what we do in play-based education, we understand the most important thing is for children to be self-motivated. And that's the most important thing in life is self-motivation, is not having to have others out there cracking the whip over you or holding the carrot in front of you. We need children, we need, we need a world of people who are self-motivated. And what better way to be self-motivated than to spend your childhood, at least, asking and answering your own questions. Mm-hmm. And the adult's job, our job is to there support them as they go through their process of how to ask and answer their own questions. So that in a nutshell, and the other piece I just want to add for what play is and why play is so important is play. And, Cause yeah, I'm getting so frustrated right now because you and I are actually having some success. The, the, yes. the people are increasingly starting to talk about, you know, what the children need to play and the play, yeah. but, but they, they always, they can't stay, help it. They can't just say play. They say play with a purpose. Mm. And that's when they suddenly start, adding again that adult thing in there so it suddenly becomes not self-directed it doesn't it's it quits being about the children's questions um a classic example is a pe class right because the people look around saying well they're playing they're playing soccer well but the adults you know are saying play by these rules there's an out of bounds line there's certain ways you have to play and what if this kid wants to touch it with their hands what if this kid wants to you know try to balance on top of the ball that's not part of the game and so suddenly their questions have to be they're considered secondary and so, of course, they lose their motivation. I'll never forget one time, watch, I went to observe a teacher. And she was a, you know, play-based kindergarten teacher, actually. And, you know, she was wonderful. And I, you know, I hope if she identifies herself in this, I don't want her to be ashamed because it's, I've been there before. Mm-hmm. But she had, she had gone out with the children. It was a fall day. And they had gathered leaves. And, you know, all children, at least to a certain extent, like doing that. They had, you know, some had just brought home one special leaf. Some had brought a big bag full of leaves. But they had all these leaves. And then she was going to extend the learning. This is always where we get in trouble. It's like, and so she had a game. She was going to get game. They were going to play with the leaves. And what she did was she, she took different types of leaves and taped them on pieces of paper at one end. And then each kid in the line had another one and they were going to have a relay race. And you had to run down and then match your leaf and then run back and tag your friend. Your next friend went down and matched the leaf. And, you know, so at first it started off, it was a ton of fun, right? I'd get to run and scream, and, you know, do this stuff. But, you know, pretty soon there was a kid like, I don't know, I had to run one time. He went over and sat on the ground. She was up there, oh, come on, come on over, come on over. And, you know, no, he wanted to sit on the, he wanted, then another kid started crumpling his leaf up and exploring what that was all about, crumpling up in the little powder. And then there were some other kids who decided they just wanted to run in circles around the room. And she spent her whole time, like you said, trying to get the kids back into the game. Like, come on, no, we're playing a game. And there were like two or three still running the, running the relay race, but they were doing it on their own, right? Yeah. They didn't need her there anymore. None of those kids needed her there. She had set up a perfect play opportunity for the children to explore this environment, the running, the leaves, the, the community, uh, the physical activity, to combine it all together in u- unique and special ways, ways that allowed them to really perceive the world and answer their own questions about that moment. Well, I think this, the point is that in those situations, you don't know what they're learning. And That's I right. think that that is the biggest piece that, that you have to embrace is being okay with, like you say in your book, and John Holt talked about it too, 
I don't need to know what it means. I simply need to understand that the children are engaged in experiments they have designed to answer their unique social emotional questions. It's not my job to know what it means. That's for them. Yeah. And I agree. I mean, and plus, I mean, I think so many teachers, and you know this, they spend so much of their days, you know, um, assessing. What did the children learn today? And you have to write these reports and I don't even know what they are. I'm glad I've never had to do it. They write all these reports about what these yeah. children learn. They have to do the report card and fill it out. What incredible hubris. Nobody can ever possibly know what another person is learning. Even if I ask you, what did you learn in the last five minutes? You're, you, don't, you might not even know. I mean, you yeah. might pop out, you're gonna answer, right? Just like kids do on a test. They're gonna give you some kind of answer. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is, is that sometimes we don't know what we're learning and it doesn't matter yeah. what they're learning. The fact is I know that they're learning because they are engaged in their own self-selected activity mm -hmm. in a beautiful, safe environment. Yeah, you know what I really love? I guess one of the things that really struck me about your book is, so our situation is we live this way. Um, but same as you, I fell into it. It wasn't because I knew anything ahead of time. We fell into it. I was struggling. We had a lot of little kids in a row and I was limited in what I could do for them. Um, and so I probably would have been the mom that had all the content standards with the check the box. That was kind of my plan. I just couldn't do it. And right. so by happenstance, by grace, you know, I've been led down this path toward play. And so we've done it. And so I trust it. You know, I, I, I've done it and I believe it and I trust it. And so what I love from your book is for someone who was scared about it, you just have story after story about what it looks like. So I'm thinking of the one story about the, the little girl that wanted to make a tree fort. <laughs> um, so, and in your book, you talk about, about, you talk about how she built a ladder and they, the kids were learning about how to put the ladder up and it was cockeyed and they, mm -hmm. you know, so, and they were trying to glue and tape and all these different things. So, you know, through, could you give a story, uh, maybe even that one or another one, whatever one you you're interested in, but, um, that sort of showcases, what does this actually look like when we sort of step back? and let kids play. Um, well, that story about Charlotte is a classic one because that yeah. one was where, you know, and Charlotte, she's a memorable kid. I think she's now probably in fourth or fifth grade, maybe even beyond that. So it's been a while since I've had her in my life, but boy, I'll never forget that kid. Um, this is the girl who one day, <laughs> who, <laughs> anyway, I won't tell that part. She, but she's a bold kid. One day she'll be your boss and you know, we'll all yeah. have to do what she says. Um, but she, she was standing on the playground one day and, uh, and she said to me, you know, teacher Tom, we should have a tree house on this playground. And, you know, and she was looking up at these big cedar trees that are on the playground. And, 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 and the, the cedars, the branches grow the wrong way for tree houses. So they're not tree house trees, but that's okay. I, that wasn't my job to tell her that. I just said, all right, all right. So, so the, we should have a tree house. So what do we need to do? And she said, well, we're going to have to get up there. And I said, all right. I said, I said so, uh, you know, we've got some ladders around the playground and we do, we have a number of different ladders. We have a, a I believe very strongly that one of the worst things we do to kids, not one of the worst, but one of the things we do to kids on playgrounds is we build these play structures with these fixed ladders that they can scamper up and down. Um, because in the real world, the ladder is not a safe thing. In the real world, the falls from ladders is a really high, you know, it's, it's one of the, from construction sites, that's like one of the number one reasons people end up in the emergency room is falling off ladders because you got to make sure they're stable. You got to make sure somebody holds it for you. You don't want to get too high or it gets top heavy. So all this, so we, so our playground never had fixed ladders. We had this like step ladder, step stools, all kinds of, so if a kid wants to get up high, they've got to go get a ladder, make it secure and get up there. So I said to Charlotte, all right, well, we have ladders. Why don't you, you know, Try those out. Oh, good idea, teacher Tom. She got her friends and they raced around and they got different ladders and they tried them all, but none of them got up to the branches because somebody before my time had pruned all the branches up out of the kids' reach because they didn't want them climbing the tree, um, which is just, uh. but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we, uh, so I, you know, I thought as a play-based educator then that the way that the orientation I have is that that's what she's going to learn. The fact that she didn't get a tree house, she didn't get up in the tree, that's not the important part. The important part is what she learned is getting up there is hard. It's pretty yeah. high. I might not have a way to get up there. And so I'm just letting her learn what she's going to learn. But this is Charlotte. <laughs> and so she got done trying all the ladders. She said, well, teacher Tom, we don't have a big enough ladder, so we're going to have to make a ladder. 
I mean, and you're talking about a preschooler. She's you know, when it, you know, like it's not tall enough. You know, you talk so much in your book about they're using ordinals in first and second. Right. This is what it looks like is that they're they're learning height and they're they're learning so many things uh, just through, you know, their explorations. Exactly. So all of this, I mean, so if I wanted to tease out the idea of learning through that, there's a ton of stuff she's doing. But, you know, the very fact that she knew, OK, well, the next step is to build one. And part of that is because we introduced woodworking at our school, you know, decades ago, and we have a workbench and the kids, you know, as young as two years old, we're putting hammers in their hands, we're teaching, you know, we're having them use saws and drills and all. So they have, they have these tools and humans are the tool using animal, right? So, you know, get, every time we give them a tool and teach, let them use a tool that suddenly opens the world up even more to them. And so, you know, she knew we had that workbench and I said, all right, well, you know, there's the workbench going in. So she, she, she got her buddies together and they found these, these two by fours, these nice long two by fours. They knew that, you know, a ladder would have to have a side part. Yeah. And you mentioned what they're learning. They're also learning a lot of social skills and a lot of working Well, together. right. You said she got her buddies together. That's I mean, right. what, a, what a skill to be able to enlist your friends in your community to help you with the project. That, I mean, well, that's, that's a life that's skill. What kids, well, that's what the kids learn in a play-based environment is mm -hmm. that the first step to doing anything is to start promoting your idea to everybody else. Hey, come yeah. on, let's all be Batman. Come on, let's, you know, whatever it is. So she got them together. She got one of them was, you know, about, you know, a foot longer than the other one or something. But that was okay. They put them on the workbench and we do have eye protection. So that is one of the requirements of the workbench because, you know, you lose an eye, that's it. Um, that's one of the few things that won't heal, right? So we mm -hmm. put the, put, they put on their eye protection. They started hammering away and they're doing the same measuring thing you were talking about. They, at once one of the nails would stick out the back, right? The pony, pony part would stick out. And they, they, they knew they couldn't leave that, right? Because as they said, and these were four and five-year-olds, the little kids might get hurt. They were, they were, they were risk assessing, not yeah. for themselves, because they're big kids. Yeah. They were risk assessing for the, they knew that two-year-olds yeah. sometimes played there and three-year-olds. So, so they would pry those out and they'd start measuring them. And, you know, they had different kinds of rungs. It was very cute because they were just finding, you know, pieces of wood, dowels, pieces of bamboo, just whatever would reach across. And, and each one was a challenge to nail. They weren't done at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And Charlotte said to me, she said, she said, just leave it down there, teacher Tom, we'll finish it tomorrow. So I was like, all right, sure, fair enough. And so they went home and for, you know, first thing in, not a ladder, and they're down there at the workbench hammering away, and they didn't get finished that day either. Um, you know, there was, it, it, there was a lot going on, right? Because there was a whole bunch of kids and, you know. It's this perseverance to stick so many, with an idea. Yeah. And they did this for a whole week. I mean, they were coming down there and it was different kids, right? It would mix and match. Like some kids would participate for half an hour and then another group would come in and some would leave. And sometimes they'd be just old Charlotte down there hammering away. But there was always, and, but we knew it was finished <laughs> when suddenly they just kind of spontaneously picked it up over their head and started walking around the playground, right? Marching around with their ladder, just like they're yeah. parading this thing they'd accomplished. And, and then they wow. took it over on the side of the playground. There's this long concrete slope. And that was poured their generation to go for erosion control. There's a parking lot up above and it was holding the parking lot up. But the kids call it the concrete slide. And they go up at the top of that and they slide down. You know, the little girls get to wear their tights one time because uh, concrete's <laughs> kind of hot on it. Uh, I had one mom, <laughs> she started every day her kids would show up and they wore rain pants with new duct tape on the seat. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way she, you know, that's the way she's mm -hmm. at. my new clothes now. And she just, so it was just duct tape, but I thought was very creative. Mm -hmm. But anyway, So the kids took it over the slope and they laid the ladder on the slope and they queued up and they started going up the ladder and sliding down the slide. And suddenly I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, all right, now this is my ego, right? So I'm talking about my ego, which has no place in this, but it's always there, right? We're human beings. And so I, and so I'm thinking, wait a minute. There's a couple of big lilacs at the top of that slope. They're almost as, for the kids, they're definitely trees. And there's a ladder that gets up there. Charlotte got her tree house. Wow. And I'm thinking, this little girl, you know, did something wow. I thought was impossible, right? Because I didn't think there was any oh, way. Wow. To get her to and I'm feeling like, I'm feeling, you know, what? Look at me, right? <laughs> Look, the play-based and, you know, you know, emergent curriculum, all those other terms we have. And I'm thinking about that. And then, but, you know, this was Charlotte. And so at some point she goes, the tree house! And she pulled the team together and they dragged that ladder over to the tree she picked out and they leaned it up against the tree and they started with the uneven side right on the ground so it, it obviously wasn't safe so they're sitting there trying to figure out what to do and they got another piece of wood and tried to stick it on there and they got some hammer they tried to nail that and that didn't work <laughs> that's what you were talking about before then charlotte yeah. said keep your tongue we need glue <laughs> and so and see this is what i think the highest 
the highest function of the adult in these in, in these situations are after safety, right? Because you mm -hmm. you still have to because we do know more about safety. But after safety is to just run to the storage room to get the stuff they need, right? <laughs> or if you're at home to run to the kitchen cabinets or wherever it is. Kids should know what supplies are available. And so you know, Charlotte knew she knew we had glue. So teacher Tom, we need some glue. So I ran into the storage room and I left another adult there to keep an eye on them. And I came out with a gallon, full gallon of the white glue, right? Um, Cause I just wanted to be dramatic. I wanted to see that I was really following through for it. And she <laughs> started dumping the glue on there like that. <laughs> Obviously it's not gonna stick. And so then she said, well, teacher Tom, I think we're gonna need some tape. So I ran back inside and I came out with a roll of masking tape. And she just looked at me with such pity. She said, oh, <laughs> teacher Tom, it has to be duct tape. And so right. I ran back in and got the duct tape and they're wrapping the tape and the glue is oozing. There's nails all over the ground. And then at one point, one of the kids had the idea of turning the ladder over. So the even end was on the ground. So now they had their ladder. They leaned it against the tree. Come on. They just stood there. And then Charlotte looked at me and said, teacher Tom, you climb it. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, I'm not going to climb it. This is virtual. Now. This is your project. I'm not going to climb that ladder. Because, you know. Yeah. She obviously was a little nervous now because this was pretty yeah. hard because this, this ladder was probably at least eight to 10 feet high. And so <laughs> you climb it. <laughs> and this, is bold, this is bold, Charlotte. Right? This is a girl who just like she's, you know, like I said, she's going to run the world someday. And she went over that ladder and she touched the first rung and she tested it. Right. Because she knew who built this thing. She tested it. And then she got on that one. She tested the next one. She tested, carefully tested each one all the way up to the top. Wow. And she got all the way up there. And this is bull Charlotte. And so she's up there. She got one arm around the trunk of the tree. And, you know, the other hand's free. And she could see the, the ship canal. There's a ship canal down below the school. And she could see the ships and the drawbridge and all kinds of stuff. And she's telling us what she sees because we didn't have any other place on the playground that high. Wow. So suddenly all the other kids had to have their turn. And what was fascinating about this is Charlotte came back down. Each one of those kids, they didn't take her word for it. Each one of them also tested, right? Because they're doing this constant risk assessment. Like I said, we think as a society that there's these little idiots out to kill themselves. No way. When no, they, they don't want to get hurt. When they're, when they, mm -hmm. they might, you know, as adults, we can contribute things like, you know, there's a nail sticking out at eye level that might hurt if it pokes you, right? You can, we can do that kind of thing, you know, pointing out hazards or removing hazards, which is really the preferred thing to do. But when they, when they decide to take on a risk, they're gonna do the risk assessment unless we, unless we start forbidding it, you know, right? Do the mental experiment, right? Say to a kid, don't climb on this wall and then turn your back. Well, they're all gonna go. I mean, all of them are gonna go over the wall. They might not all climb on it, but they're gonna go check it out. So they, they take care of themselves that way. And, they, and, and just all that learning that goes into that. And the reason I'd like to share that story is first of all about the risk assessment. Cause I think that's one of the things people mm -hmm. worry about a lot is their kids getting hurt. Yeah. And the truth is, is that I have 100% assurance your child will get hurt. <laughs> Everybody will get hurt. You'll get hurt and probably your worst injuries are not gonna be the physical ones. They're gonna be the social and emotional ones that come up through your play. And injuries are part of learning. Um, it's a big part of, 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 and it's a huge part of play. Yeah. Well, and the risk, I had heard this is a calculation. That risk assessment is like this, you know, you'd make it in such a small amount of time, but it's this like um, ratio of how how much will I get hurt in combination with how likely is it that I will get hurt. Exactly. And so and so what I have learned for from our own children is that they're so sure footed. Yeah. Now they're so sure footed. So in the long run, it's safer for them to have had those, you know, risky experiment experiences when they were younger, um, because now they know what their body can and can't do. And exactly, um, well, you it's, know, it's the only way to learn it really is to assess your own risk, right? Because, yeah. and I think that's, I think we've had a generation of kids who maybe got raised without that opportunity, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that now they're raising their own children. Yeah. And I think very often that, that that means that now they're worried because they didn't learn it. So my kid can't learn it. Yeah. And so I think it's really, it's, it's really important for us to give, um, Guy Vertulli, uh, maybe you're familiar with him. You wrote the book, 50 Dangerous Things You Should Let Your Kids Do. No, I haven't read that one. It's I love a, new book well, ideas. It, it really is a how-to book. There's 50 ideas for things, that okay. you, dangerous things you should let your kids do. Um, in our school, we, we tried to do all 50. There's a few we couldn't do. 
like let your kid drive your car. Um, and that one, I couldn't get away with that. Right, one. right. But breaking glass, we broke glass. We broke glass on yeah. purpose. And it's a fascinating thing for children. It's, it's, it's a fun thing. It's a scientific experiment. We know we made it safe, right? Yeah. We talked about it, right? Talking is such an important part of this. Yeah. It's like, okay, here's, you know, what will happen if I drop this jar on the ground? Will it break? Oh, yeah. And what happens? Oh, yeah, sharp glass. And they all know it. Then we talk about the sharp glass. We talk about what to do. Wow. So we, we, we prepare ourselves. And then we wrap it up in a towel and hit it with a mallet. And you hear it and feel it break. And then you open it up and study, you know, what happened when it happened. So there are ways to do it. And, and that, so that yeah. book is a book. To that sounds read. like a great one for parents. I, you know, I guess in, in total from your books, from both books, I think that for parents that are scared, you know, it's like you have one kid, you have a couple kids, you feel like maybe you're experimenting with them. You don't want right. to do the wrong thing. You yeah. know, we're all, we all have our, we all have good intentions, right? Mm -hmm. um, that your book showcases it what does it really look like and so you read one and it's there's so many stories in there but you read the one story about charlotte and you're you're like oh i get it you know you have this you have this paragraph in there you say when we allow children to explore their world through play we see that they are already scientists technologists engineers and mathematicians we don't create them but rather allow the time and space in which those natural uh, drives can flourish. And then you say, and that's how we ultimately ensure that our children not only have the narrow skills they may or, that may or may not be necessary for those jobs of tomorrow, but also for the broader purpose of living a good life. Yeah. And so for parents who and teachers who've not been able to see it, I think that's sort of the key. You allow them to see it. And it's like, oh, well, yeah, of course they're learning. And of course I can't find the content standard that matches those things, but you actually see that they're learning and growing and that that doesn't stop after yeah. preschool. Well, adults tend to reverse engineer when we think about learning. We used to, we start from the results we think we want and then we work backwards and children yeah. aren't doing that. They're not starting with the end result they want. That's why we'll never quite match the standards, right? Because yeah. the kids, I mean, what, what was so great about what you just said there is, you know, they, they'll learn the science of the part you read. The thing I love about that is the science, the technology, the engineering, the mathematics, that's the STEM education we keep hearing yeah. about. Yeah. I mean, they do it on their own. Every child I know loves, preschooler I know loves math. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, and they love it. Now we don't call it math mm -hmm. because what mathematics is all the way to the highest level. And I have talked to mathematicians and asked them this question. All math ever is, is finding increasingly complex and beautiful ways to organize, to pattern and to sequence. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at the end of the day, when I walk around the playground, I see evidence of math play everywhere. Yeah. Children have put all the red things together and all the blue things together, or they've, they've organized something yeah. in an AB pattern, like blue, red, blue, red, or something like that. Or they've, or they've sequenced something, or they've, you know, there was, oh, yeah, it's just all of that. And you watch that they've done this. And then we, and the way we teach math, I mean, this is, I can't remember who came up with this metaphor. So somebody will, I'm, I'm admitting this isn't my own. Um, but they said, if we taught art, the way we teach mathematics, mm -hmm. the, the first thing we would do is the children would have to spend their first year learning how to draw a straight line. No, 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 no vertical lines yet, only horizontal lines until you've mastered the horizontal. Wow. Then you can work on the vertical. Then you can start using red, then blue. And by the time you get to graduate school, you get to paint a painting. Wow. And that's kind yes. of what we do with mathematics, with, because what we do is we take it, mathematics is a real world thing, right? It's a real world, it happens in the real world. And what we do is immediately try to put it on the paper and abstract it into symbols and to, into operators and to simplifying it. I mean, the stuff you do on paper is really ciphering. That mm -hmm. means we call it mathematics, but the mathematics is a real world thing that happens inside of the head and happens with your interactions with the real world. And, and so, and, and so I, I, I'm not saying I know how to teach it at higher levels, but I do know that it, it well, moved on its own at the early like years. angles right angles would have been a thing with the ladder if your yeah. thing's cockeyed right you know so um and then when they get around yeah. to learning the ciphering they understand what they're doing and then it makes it more engaging yeah. because now yeah. they understand why they need to learn it rather than just learn this and later you'll get to use it right 
What, we're running out of time here. I think um, it's so cool that you have a six hour course coming because it's needed. There's, okay. you know, there's so much to explore. And, um, but if we could squeeze in this, this theme that runs through um, both books is this, um, this theme of there is no life without conflict. And that one of the key things that we're doing with our kids um, is we're helping them learn how to get along with other people. And one of the really interesting things that you talked about that I hadn't heard, I haven't heard people talk about yet, is that the shortening of recess kind of pairs with this not wanting to deal with conflict. And I had heard that it was just about litigation, kids getting hurt. Um, but then you talked about how, you know, 15 minutes and then once that 15 minutes is up, there tends to be a lot of conflict. You know, mm -hmm. kids are starting to fight over resources. Um, but if they could only get through that next 15 minutes, that's sort of where the magic happens. So um, what, uh, I talked too much. Um, you you know, know, can you talk much. about, can you talk a little bit about sort of that trend towards shortening recess and why, we're avoiding conflict um, amongst kids and and sort of how that would hinder, I think, a child for, you know. Well, conflict is, is, I mean, if you look at play, I mean, look at children play, there's a lot of characteristics that go into making play. True play, it's 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 self-selected, it's open-ended, it's children answering, asking answers, it's science. It's, you know, it's, it's how we learn about the con connection between perseverance, as you mentioned before, perseverance, and success, right? Failure, perseverance, and success. There's a lot of things that go into play, but one of the aspects of play people don't talk about a lot is that bickering. Yes. Bickering, bickering is an yes. essential part of play. And whenever you hear children playing at any given moment at our, yes. at our school or in any play environment, you get, kids are gonna be bickering over things. And as adults, we tend to hear that as, as a problem that we need to solve. They need us now, yeah. right? Because, because we, in our, catastrophic imaginations, we imagine, well, the next step is they're going to start hitting each other. The next mm -hmm. step is they're going to cart, you know, start calling names or do something harmful to one another. Um, and sometimes that it does go there. So that's what, you know, what you were saying is in any given play situation, and I've observed this time and time again, and I'm not going to, again, I didn't do the actual research. This is anecdotal, but I've watched it too many times to distrust it. Is any given play situation, the first, that a new situation, when children walk into it, the first 15 minutes is re, it's almost always very peaceful. I mean, you know, there might be some separation anxiety, stuff like that, but around the play, it's peaceful. The children come in and they start exploring the different materials that are available, the space that's available to them, the other children then that and tend to be kind of, then after, like you said, after about 15 minutes, that's when they start bumping up against each other. Mm -hmm. That's when they start, you know, when they start, hey, I was using that, or you knocked my building down or you've got all of them, or I want more, or something like that. And they start, you start hearing that. So as adults, we hear the voices going up, we hear the ramp, ramping up. And I think what we should do, or at least what I do, I shouldn't say should, this is what I do, is I move closer. Hmm. But I don't say anything at that point, because to me, what they're doing is exactly what adults do, right? They're doing yeah. what all of us do when we yeah. have a conflict. Is you, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, we have this conversation. And you, not, I would say, 70% of the time, if all you have to do is move a little closer and you give them a couple minutes, let it go belong slightly beyond your comfort level, right? I mean, if there's yeah. hitting, you stop that. But if it's yeah. just, it's just like, no, I want it. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. If they're yelling at each other like that, that's okay to me because mm -hmm. they're talking to each other, right? They're having, yeah. a, having an interaction with each other. And there's a lot of other techniques you can use in there, but for the most part, you stay out of it and give them a chance to, to suddenly realize, well, and then and it's after that 15 minutes when they start, they negotiate. That's called negotiation, right? Yes. We feel like conflict in preschool yeah. and with children. But in, in business, we call it negotiation. Those guys in yeah. the meeting negotiating with each other. And so they negotiate. And, they, and then that's when you start seeing, say, hey, why don't we build our buildings together? Or, you know what? Why don't you have all the red ones? I have all the blue ones. Or let's, you know, and they, they come up, they use the phrase, the best sentence in a play-based environment. You know what's working when children are starting their sentences with let's. Mm. Let's pretend, let's go over here, Aww. let's do this. Let's, because that is a statement of invitation. Yeah. And like you said, that is the most important thing. So they begin to work together. And so that's mm. why you need to get through that conflict. So you get to that beautiful part and why in any play situation, children need a minimum of 45 minutes to an hour in, yes. in order to become fully engaged. Yes. And I prefer at least a sweep of two to three hours because then you're gonna see a cycle of that, right? The conflict will come back, the, the bickering and all this stuff. 
Because at the end of the day, and I talked about self-motivation, successful people in the world, and I'm not talking about this kind of success. I'm talking about people who have satisfying relationships, who have, who have, have you know, spend their days doing things that they find personally satisfying, who have, who are healthy, who live longer. So to me, that's what success is. Successful people have three common characteristics, and they can be found across the board. One is being self-motivated. And so that's what we do in play is we give children a chance to become self-motivated about their own intelligence, their own learning, their own bodies, everything. The second one is getting, is, is getting along with others, working well with others. Because yeah. I don't care, you know, how often we talk about these, you know, Elon Musk or some, you know, big wig, you know, big name person who's, a, he didn't do it by himself. I don't care how right. much he's, in fact, I think he started with quite a bit of money from his family. Um, same with Bill Gates. Same with, you know, Jeff Bezos, same with Zuckerberg, all of them, they weren't poor people. They didn't pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They had help. They had a community. I'm not criticizing them for this. We all need help. We all need support of others. None of us are. So anyway, working with others. And the third one, and the one we forget about the most, I think, is being personable. Hmm. And that one, wow. it, it, and it, it strikes people a lot of times as that with that soul. Wow. Super, super. But you know what? If I'm true, like if I'm hiring somebody and I've got two people to choose from and they're equally qualified, I think to myself, which one do I want to hang out with? Yeah. Right? I mean, whether I can do that legally, yeah. you know we're going to do that. And, it, and when you're somebody people like to hang out with, when you work well with others and you're self-motivated, you are going to have a great life. And that's exactly what you get out of having a, a childhood, a real childhood based on play, preferably and as much as possible outdoors. Yeah. Well, Tom, you know, I think the best interviews are the ones where we barely scratched the surface of what's in your books. We barely did. There is so much in there. If people, I really, they were delightful to me and really, I was immediately going back and looking at old videos and pictures of my own kids when they were preschoolers. These oh. are fabulous books. Teacher, they're easy titles to remember. Teacher Tom's first book, Teacher Tom's second book. Tom, if people want to find you, um, tell them where to go. Well, if you want one of the books, um, we, 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 we haven't gone into business with Amazon. Um, and I will tell you, it's because- Yeah, we ordered off your website. Exactly. So uh, my website is, if you, if you want the books, it's teachertomsfirstbook.com. And that'll take, you to the, um, that'll take you to the page. You can go to teachertomsworld.com and that takes you to my website, which will also link you to any e-courses because we have other previous courses you might be interested right. in you're on the waiting list for those. Um, and then for the summit, we have our summit in June that will be taking place. And that, if, you know, that's it's a big deal. We had mm -hmm. you know, 20,000 people at it last year and some wow. really people from all over the world, wow. um, really great um, people. And we, we, we work, I just want to point out, we, we strive very much. One of the things that I'm very clear about as a white American middle-aged middle-class male is I need more perspective in my life. So that's what we, so very selfishly, I'm out there searching out people who have perspectives that you don't always hear for this yeah, summit. Beautiful. Uh, and and beautiful. diversity uh, in terms of neurodiversity, in terms of uh, indigenous uh, perspectives, in terms of racial and ethnic and gender diversity. Uh, we try to emphasize a lot more women than men because there's a lot more women in this field than men. Um, but that's, so anyway, it's, that's what we're trying to do is make it an inclusive place where people can yeah. really talk about early childhood, both for parents and for, um, and for yeah. educators. And then Beautiful. the last place, the, the, the place that, you know, you can find me every day is Teacher Tom's blog. Yeah. You just Google that and you'll find it. Yep. And on Facebook too and Instagram. So I'll make sure I share all the links. I um, mean, I'll share all those things as they're coming so people can make sure that they're aware of them. Can we wrap it up with a favorite play memory of yours um, and preferably outdoors? Do you have one from your childhood? <laughs> okay. You told me we could go a little over time. This is a good mm -hmm. story. I okay. Love okay. This. this was okay. So my family, when, and this, I was a little older. I wasn't preschool at this age. I was probably I was like 10 years old. And we lived in Greece. So our, my dad had got a job in Athens, Greece, and he was, we were there for three years. And one of the things we loved to do is go to the beach, you know, the Mediterranean beach, the nice sand, little tiny waves. You know, and my sister's a lot younger and those little waves, they were only about this big, right? And she just, she loved that. But you know, I was 10 years old. My brother and I were a little old. That was kind of boring. After a while, we got tired of being there. And there were a couple other kids with us. And, and we decided, we said, well, we decided to go climb on the cliffs. So there was this big cliff. So it was like this bay with these cliffs along the side. So we started climbing up the rocks. And pretty soon we started looking down and we realized, yeah, we're really high. And we were way above this, you know, and, you know, we could see our parents down on the beach and they were just sunning. You know, right? This was, 
This was mm -hmm. this was the seventies, right? Um, parents were a little less alert about things all the time. So we climbed up and we got way up there and we got to this landing and there was a, a tree growing there and we knew it was a fig tree and right in the middle of all these rocks because there were just ripe figs all over the ground and in the branches, just the juiciest. And I didn't even wow. think I liked figs, but we just you know, massively <laughs> ate these figs. It was like this dream come true. And we're looking out over the Mediterranean, the Aegean Sea and the blue water and we're up on this cliff and it's like this, this perfect, I mean, any adult would say, oh my God, I just found paradise. You know, we're kids, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, after we'd had our fill of figs, we saw what looked like a cave. And so we said, okay, well, let's go look in there. And we kind of looked, we called it a cave. It was really just like a big boulder leaned against another. And we, we kind of went back in there. It was dark. And then we saw light. So we knew we could get out the other side. So we followed our way through and we got out on the other side. And, and then we're out looking at this massive sweep. And we, by now we were at least a hundred feet above the ocean. So at least a hundred feet and just almost straight down. And we saw there was a trail that continued on. We go, all right, well, you know, we didn't have a time limit when we had to be back. I'm sure the little kids and the parents are having fun on the beach. So we just said, okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> and so at one point we came to a ledge and it was no more than an inch wide. And we all crossed that little ledge, you know, holding on like this. And I remember, and this is the strongest memory of this, this day for me, looking down at that moment, I stepped on that little ledge and thought to myself, if I fall, I will die. Wow. And then moved on beyond. And I couldn't go back at that point because there were kids behind me, kids in front of me. So we went on through. We got through and we all looked at each other and we just, we, we were in awe of ourselves of what we had done. And we were going back. Because <laughs> now we were scared. So we kept following the path. We thought, oh, if we follow it up, we're going to get up to the road, right? So we, we got up and there was this big, there was this road up there and it was the road we'd come in on. So we said, okay, if we head back down, that should take us to the beach. You know, here we are, you know, in the world, in a foreign country, on our own. And this was like a highway. And I remember at the time, think, and we had all already agreed, the Greek drivers were crazy. And they, and so there, there were people bombing along. There's no shoulder, there's no sidewalk. But here we are, you know, group of, you know, eight to 10 year olds walking along the side of the road with the cars bombing past us, making our way back down there. We finally, you know, we got down to the beach and our parents hadn't even noticed we were missing. And, and what a transformative and, experience. So my parents have never heard that story. They didn't drill me on what we'd done. They just assumed yeah. we were climbing on the rocks. And so for me, this is this is what childhood should be about. And, you know, I'm sure there are people going, oh, no, I'm not letting my kid climb on a cliff like that. But the truth is, someday you're going to have to turn your back. Mm -hmm. And the kids, have, and, and no one has ever stopped anybody from doing something they really want to do, ever. You might stop them today or tomorrow, but if it's something they really want to do, they're going to do it. I mean, as they get older, you forbid them to go to those parties, they're going to sneak out. They're going to find. And what, to me, what I've always said is that what our goal should be is to have our children, we, to understand our children will take risks. Our children will engage in activities that are self-selected that we might not approve of. Much better to have it happen in front of us where we can give them our best advice and our coaching and counsel and love and care when they do get hurt because ine inevitably everybody gets hurt at some point. Mm -hmm better than to have them sneak around and do it behind their back and make it yeah. incredibly dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What a, what a story. The amazing figs. I mean, you know, and it's crazy how those just, they settle into our soul stories like that, you know, that forever. I mean, that's a long yeah, time ago, like, you know, everybody listening to this, if you're nervous about play-based education, that the best way to connect yourself with this is to really reflect on your own childhood. And, and, and what I found is most people, when you think about a, a beautiful, great moment in your childhood, something that's really important to you, almost always you are, you are outside. Almost always doesn't involve toys. It almost never involves school. Yeah. It almost never involves adults. Right, right. <laughs> it usually yeah. involves a sweep of time when you were in a moment when there was no schedule and there was nobody telling you what to do. And those are those moments that are beautiful and cherished. Mm -hmm. And I would assert those are the moments that we learn the most about ourselves and our world. Yeah. Is those moments that are still with us today. Yeah. Well, Teacher Tom, you are just a delight. I mean, you have put so much amazing things into the world. And I know um, I'm just honored that you took this time to spend with us. And so um, I know people will love your books and love your blog and love your courses. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. 
Oh, thank you, Jenny. What a pleasure to meet you too. You're doing incredible work in the world and I'm really proud to get to know you. Thanks.